Jen. Um, so, oops, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I'm going to give you a little boot camp, so you are, after these 30 minutes, going to be classically trained in HCI. And HCI stands for Human Computer Interaction. Uh, last year, I finished my master's program in that and have been applying what I've learned to my work at One North. And there are some key takeaways that I took from that program that even though you are not HCI designers or UX designers, I think these will help you in your day-to-day -day job. So first, I'm going to start with proof that I did graduate. <laughs> and if we can zoom out a little bit, uh, I think you guys will get a good sense of what we're going to cover in the talk today. It's one of my three cats. Uh, so anyways, let's jump in. When you Google human-computer interaction, this is what comes up. And this is actually what, when I told my best friend that I was going back to school, she said, so you're going to build robots? And not exactly. I mean, artificial intel intelligence is certainly part of HCI, but there's a lot more to it. So HCI is an interdisciplinary field that uh, spans computer science, information architecture, graphic design, interaction design, psychology, user research, um, and so, you know, you hear this field being referred to as HCI, UX, um, but what all that means is we use all those tools to form user-centered experience designs, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, you know, I was trained as a graphic designer, I'm an art director at One North, so I'm very interested in the, the visual design and the interaction design components of that wheel I just showed you, and the reason I I was really drawn to the field of HCI is because of how strongly I felt about this quote. Design has to work, art does not. And that's a big difference to people like me. And so um, even though I'm focused on the graphic design, the visual design, the interaction design components of projects, understanding that whole wheel really lets us, you know, as a creative team, do designs that work harder, that work harder for you, your businesses, and your users. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through six kind of key takeaways that I learned from my program, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll have some fun examples. There might be a cat gif here and there. We'll, we'll see what happens. So number one uh, might seem obvious, but think like your users. This actually still needs to be done a lot better. I had a great conversation with someone last night at the cocktail hour um, saying that their firm was redoing their service structure. And for people in, in the firm, you think about it in a very specific way but your users might have a completely different mental model for how that or information makes sense. And so, you know, what I'm going to encourage you to do is, is really step in their shoes and, and think like your users. So let's look at a simple, non-digital example, uh, ketchup. So this is the iconic Heinz ketchup bottle. It has one job, and that is to dispense ketchup. How well does this work for everybody? Right? I think we've had a Seinfeld reference in every X lab up to this point. So this checks that, that box here. Uh, this will loop infinitely, so I will save you from that. So one job, to dispense ketchup, and it's really a frustrating user experience. But there's actually a trick. Does anybody know the trick? OK, I see a couple hands. The 57 on the glass bottle, you have to tap it, and that's how you get the ketchup out. But I didn't see a lot of hands. Not everybody knows this. I've been a lifelong ketchup lover, and I just found that out a few years ago. Um, and so I actually I was curious, how many people actually know that? It wasn't hard to find, because Heinz puts it right on their website. 11% of users know that that's how you get ketchup out of the bottle. They proudly put that on their website. Do you proudly put that 89% of your users can't use your product? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, what, what the heck, Heinz? Like, that's what you need this to do. Uh, so not all is lost. You know, they have improved the product over the years. You know, we went from the glass bottle to the upright squeeze tube, which at least lets you get the ketchup out a little easier. But then the user experience was really changed when they literally turned the bottle upside down because that's how you need the ketchup to flow out anyways. So this is non-digital. This is a very simple example of think like your user. So beyond thinking like your user, I'm imploring you to do so with empathy. Like I said, we're, we're all domain experts in our business, but your users often aren't. Uh, so I'm going to show you, we're going to move back into digital now. I'm going to show you a video of a very frustrating user experience I'm sure many of us can identify with. That's fighting with the office printer, right? Uh, so I brought a video. It's not the office space video, though I considered 
uh, showing that scene. And you know, I do want to warn you, we're all adults here. This is a very frustrated user, and they do use some strong language, so uh, you have been warned. This doesn't even make any sense, right? Jaws in this film, Kate was attacked. Why would you not take it? Take it. Take it. There. In a trailer. Take that. Oh good, okay. Uh, so that is the first time I've gotten a 45 second cat video in a presentation. It's been escalating ever since I came to One North. But I promise you that's very relevant. That actually leads me into the history of HCI. This is how human-computer interaction kind of came to be. So if we scroll back to 1982, Xerox had started to mass produce and mass market their in-office copiers. And they were marketed as easy to use. Well, the feedback that they were getting was that it was decidedly not easy to use. And so in what was revolutionary at the time, Xerox hired this anthropologist, Lucy Zuckman, uh, and she went to the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and she conducted uh, ethnographic research. This is really one of the first instances of corporate ethnography. And it might seem expected now, but it was very revolutionary at the time what she did was simply observed people using copiers in, in an office environment, in the context that they use them in. And she made a video, and I actually have the video. This is real, this is not a cat video. And so I'm gonna take a minute and show it to you guys. what at the time computer engineers referred to as an ID10T error. Now who knows what this is? Okay, probably a couple tech people, of course. Uh, written another way, it's an idiot error. <laughs> so the attitude used to be that if your users couldn't use this interface or this machine that your brilliant mind came up with, it was their fault, it was the dumb user. So let's take a look at who the two men in, those vi in that video were. This is Alan Newell and Ron Kaplan. They were computer scientists at Xerox at the time. Alan Newell went on to win the Turing Award. If anyone saw the imitation game last year, um, Alan Turing is who Benedict Cumberbatch portrayed in that movie, so he's a pretty smart guy. Ron Kaplan is a, was a brilliant computational linguist at Xerox, and so if they can't figure out how to make copies, I don't feel like I would have a good success rate after that. So the attitude that this user this dumb user is the reason that the machine isn't working is, is not very empathetic. And so what I'm kind of encouraging you to do is to look through the lens of your users at, at your products. So the legend is that out of this research came the, the big green easy button. It's, it's honestly not quite as simple as that. There was more research that went into it. Uh, but what Lucy Zuckman did was she showed that video to her computer engineers, and then together they worked, worked on it and made it a little bit easier to use, but I still fought with our office printer for 45 minutes this week, so there's still a ways to go on that. So number three is do your homework. Well, this is obvious when you're in school, uh, but it applies to everybody in this room as well. 
So when I say do your homework, I mean do your homework on your users. So here are 15 different user inquiry methods. You don't have to write them down. I'm going to go through these in painstaking detail in the next 30 minutes. I'm kidding. No, that would be so boring. <laughs> uh, but I do know probably what you're thinking when I bring up the topic of user research. It probably sounds expensive. And it can be, but it, it doesn't have to be. So I'm going to give you two examples from that list uh, of a easy and affordable ways that, that you could leverage some, some user research. We know that it's tough to get budget, so. <laughs> so usability testing is one way that you could test just a few people, and Nielsen Norman Group, which is a you know, pretty, um, they're an expert group that does a lot of, produces a lot of research, they studied hundreds of usability studies, and they found you only really need five to eight people, and they'll find 90% of your errors. So if Heinz had tested five people with ketchup bottles, that whole fiasco could have been avoided. Uh, so don't discount usability testing. It's an easy thing that all of us have access to. Second is secondary research. So it's great if you can do original research yourself on your users and your product, but there's a lot that we, that we can learn from research that other groups do, like Nielsen Norman Group. One is eye tracking. So this GIF existed. I didn't even have to make this. Isn't that great? Uh, so this is one of the pieces of research, one of many pieces of research that Nielsen Norman Group has put out. And what they did was they tracked um, eye movements on a variety of websites, and that's actually how they came up with the term banner blindness. So you see these heat maps. That's where users' eye, user eyes go. Look on the side. I don't. Some of those are ads. Some of them are not. Users assume that they're ads, and so they totally ignore them. So, you know, the design team at One North, we leverage research like this, and there's been a shift to more simplified um, single column layouts. And we might not always bring up research like this, but that, that's the kind of thought that's going into the designs uh, that we're putting out. So number four, design is the experience. I might be biased as an art director, but the aesthetics of your site probably make more of an impact than you think. Before we get into that, I just want to clarify the difference between UI and UX. Those acronyms get thrown around a lot. UI is the user interface. So that's what you see. UX is the user experience. That's what you feel. Uh, and I have a, an example that'll clarify that a little bit better. So here are three iPhone weather apps. This is the user interface. They're beautiful. I mean, they're leveraging you know, breathtaking photography, some cool blur effect. But if you really stop and think about the user experience, so go back to the first tip, think like your user, what do you need from a weather app? Wouldn't it be great if when you're walking out the door in the morning, it texted you saying you should take your umbrella today? I'm not obviously discounting the importance of a good UI. Um, oh, I forgot I had that in there. But, <laughs> uh, but this is, this is the type of helpful you know, text alert that could be put on top of something that's already beautiful. All right, so let's go back and take a, a more extended look at the relationship between aesthetics and UX, user experience. First, I'm going to talk about aesthetics and cognition. So this is how we perceive an interface. Does it seem like it would be usable? Um, you know, that type of thing. So I'm going to talk about, quickly, two studies, and this is what I love about the field of HCI, that we can take something like aesthetics and design research around it and give someone like me data and evidence to, to bring to people. So this study involved the use of two ATMs. They had identical UI components. So they had the same amount of buttons, same forms, all the same information. But one interface was intentionally designed to be much more aesthetically pleasing than the other. The intent of this test was to prove that there would be cultural differences, because they did this test in Israel, then they replicated it in Japan, and the researchers hypothesized that there would be a really measurable difference between cultures. They were actually proven wrong, because the, in both studies, by far the more aesthetically pleasing interface was actually perceived by the users to be more usable. So they, the users went into it thinking that this, this interface, this ATM, would be easier to use. So that's significant. Imagine that these were the two gas stations right across the street from each other, so equal convenience to you. Which one do you trust your credit card with? Right? Obviously this one. And so there is 
an element of emotion that comes into the way we perceive aesthetics in our, in our machines. So that's what I'm gonna talk about next. There was another study, it's really fascinating, it had a really pretentious title, like luxury web atmospheric, something like that. But what it did was it tested a fake kitchen appliance company, Albrecht, used basically the same photos, and it designed two different website homepages, and then it surveyed users and said, which is the luxury line? Which one looks more luxurious? What do you guys think, the one on the left or the one on the right? Right. So if I asked you why, some of you might be able to articulate it, but you might, you might not know exactly why. Well, these researchers you know, broke it down into components like full screen imagery, reduced navigation elements on this one, just less UI clutter, things that designers kind of know instinctively, but this, this gave us some data to support that. You see this replicated in the retail space. You know, here is uh, accessories, a shoe section at a department store and at a, at a you know, designer boutique. And so while it's pretty clear which is the luxury brand, you, you might not consciously know why, but I can tell you, everything is perfectly planned in this luxury boutique. The lighting, the spacing, there's one purse on one shelf. Um, there's a lot of care that went into all those little details. And so, you know, when we think about design and how it affects our perception, how it affects the user experience, this is Johnny Ive, many of you know, he's the chief design officer at Apple. He said this perfectly. We, so users, are capable of discerning far more than we are capable of articulating. So just because a user can't tell you why they like something or they can't tell you why they think this brand you know, is higher end, users are getting very sophisticated and so they are able to discern those differences. So it still is very important that we pay attention. Uh, number five, you're never really done. This is more than just how I felt at the end of my program. What I'm talking about here is a new approach to design. So rather than a linear approach to, let's say, a website project, what we recommend now is more cyclical. It's more constantly iterating, constantly evaluating your designs, testing them, and then adjusting on the fly. Again. <laughs> so this, this kind of process, this kind of approach, is what we call design thinking. Who's heard of that term? It's kind of a buzzword now. Probably most people, yeah. So it was on the cover of Harvard Business Review in September. It's, like I said, it's very um, kind of of the moment. And you, you might wonder, like, well, what the heck is design thinking? We're not saying that you need to go around and pay attention to fonts and colors. That would be great, but you don't have to do that. Uh, what that means is, is really well summed up in this quote. And this is from Tim Brown, who's the CEO of IDEO. It says, design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. So that's a great description of design thinking. So that's something that all of us can do and take back to our marketing teams, our technology teams, um, and just kind of embrace that, that new approach. So finally, number six, UX is everyone's job. That's how we feel at One North, and that applies to everybody in this room. We all make decisions as part of projects that end up affecting the user experience. So we've already talked about aesthetics. It can have a big effect on UX. Information architecture can have a big effect. Are you confusing your users? Are you helping them? Content, people forget about that. Content, especially on content-heavy sites like many of those in the, you know, in the room, that affects the user experience. And finally, performance. You could have the most beautiful site in the world with the most clever you know, information architecture, the best content. If it takes four seconds to load, nobody's going to see it. Users expect your site to load in two seconds, and after three seconds, 40% will abandon you. If your site doesn't load in three seconds, 40% of your users are going to give up. So all of these components really come together and that's, that's what makes your user experience. So I want you to think about all of those elements, aesthetics, uh, content, performance, information architecture. Think of those as instruments that help play the song, with the song being your user experience. Sorry, I had to get one more in. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so the boot camp is over, but I've got some homework for all of you. So I've just told you that UX is your job too. So a couple good resources. Here are six, seven-ish great books. Some are more design-centric, some are more behavioral. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow is, is not a UX book, but it's a great book about cognition and the psychology of decision-making, so highly recommend that. And then here are a couple, and these slides will all be online later, here are a couple great online resources that you can consult with regularly to see what's happening in the space. And honestly, Twitter is where a lot of the web and UX community, this is where the conversation is happening. I have a list on my Twitter account that collects all the web and UX people that I follow, so you're welcome to, to, to use that. Okay, so just to review everything that we've covered today, what I'm advocating for is that you think like your users, you do so with empathy, do your homework, do your user research, keep in mind the importance of aesthetics, know that you're never really done, adopt that new design thinking approach, and don't forget UX is all of our job. Thank you. Thank you.